I'll start with just one verse, verse, verse one. James says, my brother. Now that statement, my brother, indicates that he's starting a new subject and he's talking to Christians. He says, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and here's the topic, with respect of persons. James is telling us that we should not, as believers, show favoritism or have respect of persons. Now, I got my title from the New English Bible translation of verse 1, where it's rendered, my brothers believing as you do in our Lord Jesus Christ, who reigns in glory, you must never show snobbery. I love that. So if you are a Christian, basically he's saying that showing snobbery or being a respecter of persons is inconsistent to being a person who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian and a follower of Christ, it is inconsistent for you to be a respecter of persons. You know, one of the best ways to test the reality and the maturity of your Christianity is how you treat people. If your doctrine lifts you so high that your feet don't touch the ground, it's false doctrine. If your Christianity doesn't change the way you view people, talk to people, deal with people, love people, show mercy to people, then it's not genuine or authentic Christianity. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you're what? My disciples. Did you have what? Love. Love is the birthmark of a true believer. Not that we accept sin in the lives of others or approve of uh, sinful lifestyle, but we should love them because Christ died for them. If they're believers, Christ is in them. If they're unbelievers, Christ died for them. And we should never judge a person based on outward appearance, for God looks not as men look, God looks on the heart. One of the overarching themes of this whole text we look at today is that God looks at the heart. We look on the outward appearance and we make a judgment, but it's not based on reality. What we're doing is what we know as judging a book by its what? Cover. We should never judge a book by its cover. We should see that God looks at the heart and that's what we should be looking at as well. Now we've seen in the book of James, to just rehearse real quickly, that the mark of the mature Christian is number one, joyful, in trials. This is chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. If you are a true believer, that you'll rejoice even in your trials, knowing they work for you and not against you. Second mark of maturity is that they are triumphant in temptations, chapter 1, verse 13 to 18. So they're joyful in trials, they're triumphant in temptation. And then thirdly, we saw that they practice the Word of God, chapter 1, verse 19 to 27. And that means that they're doers of the word, not hearers only. So three marks of maturity, joyful in trials, triumphant in temptations, and practice the truth of God's word. Then fourthly, we come to it this morning as our topic, they are actually showing, not showing respect to persons, partiality or snobbery. So when he says there in verse one, do not hold or have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to of persons. That is a sin, he's going to say, and it is against the grace of God or contrary to God's grace. Now, unfortunately, it was happening in James's day. There was a great rift. You think that we have race, racial prejudice today in America? In the New Testament times, it was even worse. They had Gentile on one side and Jew on the other. Never the twain met. If a Jewish person was walking through Gentile area, when they left the Gentile area, they would take their sandals off and knock the dust off their sandals, then step into the Jewish area, put them back on, because they didn't want to bring dirt from the Gentile area into their turf. They would walk hundreds of miles out of the way, not go through Gentile land unless they get cooties. And there was a great hatred, even The early church was rift with this Jew-Gentile issue, whether Gentiles could be saved, and whether there be one church, Jew and Gentile, or there be two churches, Jew and Gentile, and it took some time for them to realize we're one in Christ, Amen? amen? The answer to modern racism and this partiality 
and showing snobbery is Jesus Christ. He breaks down the walls of barriers. We know from the Bible that God created all men equal, amen? And they're all loved in his sight. So what's happening in James's day, and unfortunately and sadly it's common in our own day, and sadly it's common in the church. There are Christian snobs in the church that look at what people are wearing, the color of their skin, their social status, and these things should not be a part of those who believe and follow Jesus Christ. Now, there are three main points, if you're a note taker in this text, and I'll give them to you one by one. The first is the command, we read it in verse one, to stop showing snobbery or respect a person. So it's an actual command. So to show respect of persons is a violation of this command. Go back with me to verse one. My brethren, as I pointed out, He's writing to believers, so this is a problem in the church and in the assembly of believers. Have not. Now, in the Greek, this is what's called an imperative. It's actually a command, and it could be rendered stop having faith in, not of, but in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in my King James translation, the words the Lord are italicized, so they don't belong there in the text. It's just the Lord of glory with respect of persons. So it's actually saying that if you are a believer in Jesus, he is the Lord of glory. He sits on the throne in heaven. It's inconsistent with his deity and his majesty that we would show respect of persons. And there the word appears in our text for the first time in verse 1, respect of persons. Now, what does the word respect of persons mean? He says, stop showing respect to persons. The word comes from two Greek words. The first one is face, and the second one is receive. It comes from the idea of face and receive. What it means is that you accept someone or reject someone based on their appearance. Now, it could be the color of their skin. It could be their social status. It could be that they're a male or a female. It could be that they're from a certain country their ethnicity, could be their social status or their money or the way they dress. We accept them or reject them based upon their physical appearance, their face value. And we're going to see that this is not consistent with being a follower of Jesus Christ. God looks not as men look, right? But God looks where? On the heart. So we as believers need to look as God looks on the heart. James says it's inconsistent with faith. And I like this fact that says, in our Lord Jesus Christ of glory. The object of your faith as a Christian is Jesus Christ. He's not only your Savior and Redeemer, He's your example. Amen? And all through the Bible, we see Jesus did not show favoritism. Now, we could be here For quite some time, I could have given you a whole string of verses from both the Old Testament and the New Testament where it says, God is no respecter of persons. God is no respecter of persons. All through the Old Testament, when God spoke to the judges, he said, you're not to judge the poor differently than you judge the rich. When you go to court, you don't want the judge looking at the clothes you wear or your income. He wanted to be judging righteously according to the law. And then in the New Testament, it's all through, God is no respecter of A person. So the verse and makes that statement clear, both Old and New Testament. But Jesus was not a respecter of person. Let me give you some examples. First of all, I think of Luke chapter 21, I'll give you the text, where Jesus was talking to the disciples about the widows who gave the two mites. Now, he was in the temple in the area known as the court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles had on the walls what they called the coffer treasury receptacles. They were trumpet-shaped with a large part of the base hanging on the wall. They would put their money in it, and it would actually go to the base of the, the, the receptacle. So they were watching, the disciples were watching rich people put their money in the offering, and they were probably doing it very ostentatiously. They were showing off. And the disciples were so impressed with the rich people that they said to Jesus, did you notice how all the money and the wealth that these guys are putting in the offering? 
Now, Jesus observed, though, when this widow came, she reached into her little purse and she took out two pence. Now, two pence is the best we can calculate. It would be today half a penny. Not even a penny. And she went one, two, clink, clink, and do the thing. Jesus said, well, I'm going to tell you guys something. I have a lesson for you. This poor widow, this widow put in more than the rich men collectively, all that they put in. She put in more. And they thought, wow, how could that possibly be? Here's the answer. God looks at the heart. He said, they gave out of their abundance. No big deal. They did it to be seen of men. They have their reward. People applauded for them. But the widow, she gave it out of her, the text says, penury, her poverty. It's the same word used for the poor man in our text today. Absolute, abstract poverty. Just dirt poor. And she gave sacrificially. She gave willingly. And she gave lovingly to God. So she gave more than they all. So one of the lessons, and this isn't the point I want to make, but I want to bring it out, is that God does not look at the amount that we give. He looks at the attitude of the heart that we give with. God is not impressed with your great gifts to him if your heart is not right. God wants your heart, not your wallet. Now, our wallets are a blessing, and he lets us participate, but God doesn't need our money, amen? Amen. God's not impressed with the amount of money we give. Sometimes people think, if I give a lot of money, then it justifies me living however I want to live. That's not true. So he was looking at this widow's heart and the sacrifice in which she gave. Jesus is not impressed with rich people. There's no respecter of persons. And then in John chapter 4, a classic example, when Jesus was passing through the area of Samaria, which was actually a despised area, he didn't go around it, he went through it. And he met at Jacob's well with a woman of Samaria, a Sychar well. And he asked her, would you give me a drink of water? Now, she was shocked, you're a Jew, and you're a man and I'm a woman, and you ask me to give you a drink of water? She said, the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans. Now, Samaritans were half Jewish, half Gentile. So they were considered despised by the Jews. So she says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, but though the Jews had no dealings with them, Jesus did, amen? And Jesus began to speak to her about her need for this living water. He said, go call your husband. And she said, well, I have no husband. He says, right on, sister. It's not there in the text, I just paraphrased it. He said, you've had five. She's starting to squirm. And the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. She said, I am so busted. She said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. You betcha. But she came to faith in Jesus Christ. When the disciples came back from running an errand, they saw Jesus speaking to this woman of Samaria, sinful woman of Samaria, they were shocked. And Jesus said to her, look, and she came back from the city with all the people that she brought. The fields are white and ready for harvest. Jesus looks not as men look, but Jesus looks upon the heart, and he deals with even those who are despised and outcasts. And then the rich man Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 is another example. Now, he was rich. He wasn't poor, but he was rich because he was a thief. And he was robbing the Jewish people of their taxes for the state of Rome, for the nation of Rome, or the Roman government. So he was hated, he was rejected, and he was despised. But Jesus was coming through his town. So he was little of stature. He was a short little guy. And so he wanted to see Jesus in the great crowd, so he climbed up a tree. And Jesus came walking by, stopped looked up, saw Zacchaeus, this dignified tax collector, wealthy man, hanging onto a branch up in the tree, looking down. And I love that story. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down from going to your house for lunch. Now, that's a biblical basis for inviting yourself over to lunch. 
Try it in the foyer after church. Hey, I'm going to your house for lunch today, and it better be good. So Jesus went home with the despised, hated tax collector, and the disciples thought, he's going to get cooties for sure. And after some time meeting with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus came out and he said, half of what I've stolen from you, I'm going to give back. Now, when a tax collector returns money, you know they've been saved. <laughs> Amen? So Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. He looked at Zacchaeus' heart. Now, just a little footnote again. This passage doesn't condemn being rich. Nowhere in the Bible are riches condemned per se. Trusting in riches is condemned. Ill-gotten riches is condemned. But if God has blessed you, just humbly appreciate the fact that God has blessed you and put not your trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all things to enjoy. Amen? But this passage isn't saying we should hate the rich or despise rich, that would be reverse discrimination. We're to look at the heart, we're to look at the heart, we're to look at the heart. Rich people need Jesus and poor people need Jesus. Now we're gonna see that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised. But generally speaking, God's chosen poor people to magnify his grace, which is so very important. But we're to stop showing respect of persons. We need to see others through the eyes of Jesus, not a Christian, then we should say, well, Christ died for them. Sometimes we as Christians despise non-Christians. That ought not to be. We don't approve of their sin. We don't approve of their behavior. But they're people for whom Christ died, amen? And when they come to church, we shouldn't look at the clothes they're wearing or the way they look. We should welcome them. They're coming. They can hear the gospel. And if they are a Christian, then Christ lives in them. So if a person is not a Christian, Christ died for them. If a person is a Christian, Christ lives in them. So verse 1 is the command. It's an imperative. Stop having faith. And Jesus, by the way, is the object of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to person. Now, the second main point is verses 2 to 4. And that is the illustration of snobbery. So he commands us to stop showing snobbery. Then he illustrates showing snobbery in their assembly. Verse 2. For they're coming to your assembly. The word assembly is the Greek word where we get our word uh, synagogue from. And it carries the idea of a gathered group of people. It's also a synonym for the word ekklesia in the Greek, which is the word church. So this is the New Testament church. It could be that it indicates that we're meeting in a, in, in a synagogue. More likely, it just is using the term that was common in that day for assembly or gathering together. It's the only place that's used in that context. So they're coming to your assembly or gathering, a man with a gold ring. And I'll go back to it in a minute, but it's plural. It's rings. In goodly apparel, that means very expensive, fine clothing. And they're coming also a poor man in vile raiment. Now, again, the Greek word translated poor means abstract poverty, abstract poverty, poverty stricken, dirt poor. The word vile means dirty, filthy clothes. So not only poor clothes, but they were actually soiled, probably smelt, they were dirty. And it says, here it is, verse 3, if you have respect to him that wears the beautiful clothes or the expensive clothes, you say to him, sit thou here in a good place, but you say to the poor, stand thou there. You can stand in the corner or sit here under my footstool or you sit on the floor. So you're showing favoritism to the rich and you're despising the poor. Now, in verse 4 is the application. Are you not then partial in yourselves? Now, verse 1, we have it referred to as respect of persons. In verse 3, you have respect to him that wears the bright, beautiful clothing. And then in verse 4, it's defined as being partial in yourself. So you are showing partiality. And then in verse 4, you become judges of evil thoughts. 
That's the application. Your evil thinking judges or judges with wrong standards. Now, this is probably a hypothetical story. It's probably not a situation you actually heard about, but it did take place commonly in their assembly, and he's trying to rebuke them into repentance for this sin. So it's probably just a picture of what could happen in the church. So on, as they were gathered together, a rich man dressed in beautiful clothes, wearing multiple rings on his fingers. Now, in the ancient world, one of the ways, or two of the ways, that you showed your wealth was your clothes and rings. And the Greek actually has rings on his fingers. So some Greek scholars believe that every finger, every finger on both hands were covered with rings. You know, they actually had places where you can rent rings to wear for social outings so you can impress people with your wealth. One Bible translation has gold fingered. So he had all these rings on his hand. He had the finest clothes, drove the finest chariot. And when he pulls up to church that Sunday, the ushers are falling all over themselves to give this guy the best seat in the house. Whoa, a rich dude's here today. Let's give him the nicest seat. And they helped him to the nice seat, placed him in the nice seat. And then a poor man shows up. He crawled out from under a bridge, kind of stunk, kind of looked at him like, oh, I hope he doesn't come to church. I hope he passes by the church. But he came into church. The usher said, well, you can stand in the corner. Or if you need to sit down, you can sit on the floor. This ought never to happen in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The ground is all level at the foot of the cross. God looks at the heart. He doesn't look at our clothes. We should never cater to those that are rich or affluent or look the way we want them to look, but we should look at the heart, treat all men with respect and dignity. So this poor man is told, you can sit on the floor or stand in the corner. So they have respect to him that wears the beautiful, expensive clothes, but they showed partiality, verse 4, and they were judges of evil thoughts. Now that phrase, judges of evil thoughts, could be translated evil thinking judges or judges with wrong standards. Your evil thinking judges are your judges with wrong standards. You know, this has been a problem in the church in the 18th century England, to give you one example, you could only go to church if you paid money and you rented your own pew. The pews had little doors at the end of each end of the pew, and they had a family name on the pew. And you paid money to sit in that pew. If you didn't have any money, you had nowhere to sit in the church. You couldn't come into the church. So John Wesley began to go outside and preach the gospel to the common people. And those in the fields that John Wesley preached to would met, number up to the thousands, sometimes 30,000 in the open field without a public address system. And it was said that the coal miners working under the earth, their faces would be black from the cold as they would hear John Wesley preaching there would be white streaks running down their face as they began to cry and hear the gospel. So the birth of the Methodist movement and the Methodist church and the Wesleyan revivals of the 18th century in England, which came over to America. A hundred years later, William Booth was bringing poor people into church and he was rebuked. You can't bring this riffraff into church. They need to clean up. They need to they need to get some Christian clothes on, get a Christian haircut, whatever that is. So William Booth went to the streets and began to share the gospel with the poor, and we had another revival, the birth of the Salvation Army. So all through the church's history, in the early 60s and through the early 70s, through the 60s and 70s, we had the Jesus movement. We're all quite aware about the movie recently that came out, The Jesus Revolution. Well, I was one of those Jesus people. I was one of those hippies. I remember going to church. I'd gotten saved. My hair was long. My beard was humongous. 
has scrubby clothes on. And people say, when's he going to look like a Christian? I remember saying, I look more like Jesus than you do. <laughs> what are you talking about? I've seen the pictures of Jesus. I look like Jesus. Thank God for Chuck Smith, amen? amen. Open the doors of Calvary Chapel, and the hippies were coming in, and they were sitting in the pews, and they were putting their toes through the communion cup holders. <laughs> and some of the senior saints with snobbery said, this is the abomination of desolation, <laughs> spoken of by Daniel the prophet. We're living in the last days. And someone put a sign in the foyer saying, no bare feet allowed. Chuck said, would, took, out, took down the sign and said, if we're not going to allow them in with their bare feet because it ruins the carpet, we'll tear out the carpet. We had the birth of the Jesus movement, and thousands of smelly, dirty hippies came to Christ. And I'm one of them, amen? What a blessing. Many of you, too. No wonder James says, have not faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Write down Proverbs 22, 2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. I love that. Proverbs 22, 2. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of of them all. So in verse 1, we have the command not to show respect to persons. In verses 2 to 4, we have the illustration. And then now here's the third main point in verses 5 to verse 13, and that is the reasons to stop showing snobbery or showing respect to persons. He actually gives us three reasons why we should stop showing snobbery or respect a person. Here's reason number one, verse five. It's a theological reason. Notice verse five. Hearken, my beloved brother. Now, verse one, my brethren. Now, as he's beginning to make more application, my beloved brother, and he's appealing to their emotions. Hath not God chosen, underline that word chosen, the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him. Now, here's the point, and then I'll break it down a little bit. The point is that showing favoritism, showing respect of persons, showing partiality, being a snob, is actually contrary to the grace of God. It's contrary, inconsistent with God's grace, because God in his grace has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Now, the word chosen in verse 5 is the very same Greek phrase used for God's electing or choosing us to salvation. And this is just a footnote in the book of James, but it's taught through the New Testament. If you are a Christian, Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I have what? That's humbling. I've chosen you. But it's important to understand the basis on which God chooses us, not because of the color of our skin, not because of our money, our income, our status, our education, not because of our nationality, but because of his what? Grace. Grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. No one is saved because of something they are or something they do. Even that you repent and believe, you're still saved by grace, and salvation is by the grace of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what he's trying to say there in verse 5. Now, chosen, the poor of this world, is in a general sense. It doesn't mean that rich people aren't saved and God doesn't choose them as well. The Bible says, you see your calling, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 29. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. He didn't say not any. He said not many. And in the early church especially, the majority of Christians were poor. And they might be owned by a slave master. In the New Testament, there's a story of Philemon and a slave Onesimus. 
And Onesimus ran away from his master Philemon and got saved under Paul's ministry in Rome. Paul sent him back to his master and said, receive him now as a brother. So slave and his master would go to church and be equal. And sometimes a slave would be given a gift of teaching. He would get up and preach the word. And his master would be sitting there listening to him preaching the word of God. In the church, this is why the church and Christ is the answer to our divisions in our country today. Amen? Amen. We need Jesus. We need the church. So they were not to be divided over race and different things, the face uh, description of judging someone by his appearance. So, Warren Worsby said this, a class church is not a church that magnifies the grace of God. I love that. A class church is not a church that magnifies the grace of God. A congregation should reflect God's grace. We're not Jew, we're not Gentile, we're not bond, we're not free, we're not Greek, we're not Scythian. We're not male, we're not female. In Christ, we're all one. This is clear in the book of Acts chapter 10. When God wanted to save a Gentile named Cornelius in his household, he was a Roman soldier, a centurion. He was living in Caesarea. He sent an angel to Cornelius and said, send to Joppa down the coast, and you'll find a man in the house of Simon the Tanner named Peter. And you'll tell Peter that he's to come to you and preach all the words of this life. So Peter was at this Tanner's house. He was up on the roof. And he was taking a nap as they prepared this lunch downstairs. And he fell asleep and had a vision. And in this vision, he saw this big sheet with four ropes holding the corner coming down from heaven. And on this big sheet were all these unclean animals, according to Jewish Levitical law. And a voice said to Peter in his dream, get up and eat them. And Peter responded to the Lord in his dream, said, no, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And then the Lord said, Peter, what I have cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. And the moment that happened, he woke up and there was a knock on the door he opened the door, and Gentiles were at his doorstep from Cornelius' house. And so he let them in because God had prepared him through the dream. He said, what do you want? And he said, well, a few days ago, our master Cornelius was praying, and God sent an angel to him and said, send to Joppa for one Simon Peter in the house of a tanner, and he would come and tell you all the words of life. So Peter began to put two and two together, and he said, well... I guess God wants to save Gentiles. So, okay, I'll go with you. But I want you to know it's not, it's not right. It's against the law, but I'm going to go with you. So he went to the Gentiles. And what a great way to open your sermon for the house of Cornelius. He said, first of all, I want you to know you're all unclean and I shouldn't be here. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter. We're glad to see you too. But he said, God has showed me that I should never call anyone common or unclean. He said this in Acts 10, verse 34. Peter said, God is no respecter of persons. Isn't that beautiful? Peter says, God showed me he is no respecter of persons. And he preached the gospel. The Holy Spirit fell. They were all saved and filled with the Spirit. And God was saving the Gentiles. So a class church is not a church that magnifies the grace of God. Now, the second reason is a logical reason. So a theological reason, verse 5. And then the logical reason, verse 6 and 7. He said, but you have despised the poor. So in a general sense, not in an exclusive sense, verse 5, God chooses the poor of this world. When he says rich in faith, that's rich in the sphere of faith. So you're in this world poor, but as far as toward God, you, are great, you have great wealth. That's the true wealth. But the contrast, verse 6, but you have despised the poor. God's chosen them. You've despised them. Then he asks this question, does not the rich oppress you, draw you before the judgment seats? That's the law courts. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? Now, I want you to note at the end of verse 5, a question mark. At the end of verse 6, 
another question mark. At the end of verse 7, a third question mark. So these three verses are filled with rhetorical questions that expect a yes answer. Didn't God choose the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom? Yes. God chose them. God gave them riches. And God's going to give them the kingdom. I love that. He says, then secondly, do not these rich people that you are showing favoritism toward blaspheme that worthy name, which is the name of Jesus, by which you are called, and do not they also draw you before the judgment seats of the law courts? Yes, 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 three times. So he's showing them that their favoritism toward the rich is illogical. Now again, don't forget, he's not condemning wealth. So we, we shouldn't despise rich people. If rich people want to come to this church, they're welcome. But they're going to be treated like poor people, anybody, right? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't say this first service, but for all the years I've been a pastor, I've never, ever, 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 and uh, God's grace, I never will, I never know how much anybody in the church ever gives to the church. I have no idea if you give a penny to this church and it does not influence the way I treat you or love you or serve you. It has nothing to do with that. I don't want to know because I don't want to show favoritism. Because you're people for whom Christ died and whom Christ lives. So we should not be showing favoritism to the rich or despising them or showing favoritism to the poor or despising them. We should treat all people equally in the church. So important. But he shows you, verse 6, you're favoring them, they exploit you. You're favoring them, verse 7, they blaspheme God. So very important. Now, not only theological reason, not only a logical reason, but now, in closing, a biblical reason. This is the largest section, and we won't tarry. But in verse 8 to verse 13, he gives us biblical reasons, two of them, why showing favoritism is wrong. Now, first of all, it is the breaking of the royal law, verse 8 to 13, or verse 8 to 13, but it's the breaking of the royal law, verse 8 to 11, excuse me. For if you fulfill the royal law, now it's called the royal law because it comes from God and it governs others' law, other laws, it's taken from Leviticus 19, verse 18. If you fulfill or keep the royal law according to the scriptures, here it is. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the royal law. You do well, but if you have respect of persons, verse 9, you commit sin. So flat out, you're sinning. And you're convinced of the law as transgressor. So you're sinning and you're breaking God's law. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet, verse 10, offend in one point, he or she is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. If thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor. So here's reason number one, biblically, that we should stop showing favoritism. It's a breaking of God's royal law. Now, they came to Jesus... And they asked Jesus, they said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. But he didn't stop there, right? He said, and love your what? Neighbor. How? As yourself. You know, we all innately are narcissistic. You don't believe me? Anytime you're in a group photo and you see a copy of it, who's the first person you look for? Oh, my hair doesn't look good. Oh, the lighting was bad. Oh, I should have turned sideways. I look fat. And even though you know you're stoked on yourself, we're narcissistic. So no man ever hated himself, so we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. So they asked Jesus, what's the great commandment? Love God, love your neighbor. By the way, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, 
The first set of commandments deal with our relationship to God. Loving God takes care of them. The second set of commandments deal with our loving our neighbor as ourself. If I love my neighbor as myself, I won't lie, I won't murder, I won't commit adultery, I won't kill, I won't covet. So those two laws actually are called the royal law. In verse 12, it's called the law of liberty because it comes from God and controls all the other laws. Now, loving your neighbor as yourself is a fulfillment, verse 8, of the royal law. So you're doing well. But someone said, I have no problem loving my neighbor as myself if I can choose the neighborhood. <laughs> Last night, about four houses away from my wife and I where we live, two o'clock this morning, two o'clock this morning, all this crazy noise was going on, screaming and yelling. And I thought about this verse I have to preach on today. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. Lord, I do, but not that house down the street. Yet. I do, but not at 2 o'clock in the morning. I felt like getting a megaphone. I have to preach tomorrow. Shut up. God loves you. Go to bed. See you at church. Oh, I, I, I love my neighbor, if I can pick my neighborhood. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Again, the Samaritan, the hero of the story. He showed love to the man in need. And the message of the Good Samaritan, anyone in need is my neighbor. Doesn't matter what race they are, doesn't matter who they are, anyone who has a need is my neighbor, and I should show them love and care and concern. So respect of persons is inconsistent with God's law. And then secondly, we will be facing future judgment. So the biblical reasons are it fulfills the royal law or breaks the royal law. Only one link on the chain needs to break for it to be a lawbreaker. And by the way, I missed it, but verse 11, he quotes from the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and he says, do not commit adultery. That my beloved, is in the Bible. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's a breaking of God's law. That's commandment number seven from Exodus 20, verse 14. And then he said also, do not kill. Exodus 20, verse 13, it's the sixth commandment. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? And by the way, there's an amazing parallel between the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James. Jesus said, if you have anger in your heart towards somebody, you've murdered them. You've broken the commandment. If you have lustful desires towards somebody, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You are transgressors of God's law. But secondly, in verse 12 and 13 in closing, we will face future judgment. He says, so speak ye and do as they that shall be judged by law of liberty. So we should speak our words and do our works in light of the fact that we should be judged by the word of God, the law of liberty. As I pointed out in verse 8, same as the royal law. For, ye, for he shall have judgment, verse 13, without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against Judgment. Remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the what? Merciful, for they shall what? Obtain mercy. You know if you give mercy, you're going to receive mercy. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He said, well, wait a minute, Pastor John. I thought we as Christians weren't going to be judged for our sin. That's true but we will be judged for our works. Our words speak, our works do. Both those in that verse. I believe it's possible to have a saved soul and a wasted life. You're going to heaven when you die, that's for sure, salvation secure. But will you hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? 
Are you showing favoritism or respect of persons? We will stand before the beam of the reward seat of Christ. And we will give an account to God for our words and for our works. There's no place for snobbery in the life of a true Christian. So to summarize our text, respect of persons or partiality is inconsistent with the faith in Jesus Christ. It's inconsistent with the grace of God. And it's a transgression of God's law. And we will one day, let us not forget, have to give an account to God for the way we dealt with and treated other people. You say, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, that's good. I've never murdered. That's good. But in your heart, you've been critical, fault-finding, judgmental, and you've shown respect to persons. And that's transgression for which we should repent and ask God to forgive us. Let's pray.